machine learning is actually really easy to understand. It's the same way that we teach our kids. It's the same way that we learn, to be honest. It's looking at a bunch of data, finding the patterns. It's an input-output. You don't need to understand anything that happens in the middle, making technology invisible, which really just means something that comes naturally to you as a human so that you can focus on something else that you enjoy doing. We're just going to see a lot of small optimizations like that, where our lives just got just a little bit easier because the machine is able to take over just a little bit more. I think in order to be wildly creative, in order to like increase your creative capacity, you need to be able to see the effect of what you're doing in real time. Throughout the day, you will be able to focus on what you're doing much easier if you start off with meditation. Once you remember that you're going to die, it really helps refocus you in the moment. Like you can do anything you set your mind to. Don't hold yourself back. Hey, it's Nono, and this is the Getting Simple Podcast. Before we get started, I want to remind you that you can get to a detailed list of episode notes at gettingsimple.com forward slash Adam. You can listen to this episode on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on YouTube, or whatever you get your podcasts. Today I'm in San Francisco, California with Adam Menges. Hello, Adam. Hey. How's it going? Yeah, it's going well. To give you a brief introduction... Adam Menges studied computer science at Colorado State University Yep. in a non-conventional way, I would say. We'll hear more about how you got to today, Adam. But as a summary, I know that Adam has worked with SendGrid, with Apple, machine learning projects. Yep. And he's now uh, writing his new adventure called Love AI that was uh, acquired by Microsoft. Yeah. Adam and I met at Smart Geometry in Toronto in May 2018. Yeah, pretty awesome conference. What I would like to hear a bit more is how you got to where we're today. And maybe we can hear a bit more about Loeb AI and more about your daily habits, routines, or some other technology tips or some other things that make your life be a bit more idiosyncratic or different than others. Man, every time I'm asked about myself, I feel like a, like a computer trying to like page in information from like a tape drive. Like all this stuff that happened years ago, and I'm just trying to page it all back into memory. So starting off chronologically, I was homeschooled. And probably the biggest thing that this added to my life is that I was able to structure my days however I wanted. So in Colorado, the way that homeschooling works is basically you go into like a government facility every six months and you take a big test that kind of confirms that you've learned as much as you should. Outside of that, they don't really care how you learn. It's completely up to you. And so I was able to structure my schedule to be, you know, one week of math, one week of biology, one week of whatever. And I really enjoyed doing that. I thought it was really useful to be able to like fully dive into one subject for a little while and then fully dive into the next one. Instead of like a typical school day for most kids would be, you know, an hour of math, an hour of biology, an hour of whatever. And they get home and they do homework on all the different subjects. I actually found that really useful. And that carries over into the way that I work now where I'll spend a week or two honing in on a particular feature, a particular part of the product but never trying to like splay myself into many different directions. And, you know, there have been a bunch of different studies that show how context switching, like no one can actually context switch, even if you think you can multitask. There's a huge cost with context switching. So I try to keep that a minimum when I was younger and then definitely into daily life now. And so from there, I went to college. I was able to do it in 2.5 years, which is shorter than most. And when I first went to my advisor and told him this, I said, no, 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 like people don't do that. That's too short. You're going to burn out. I went ahead and kind of ignored his advice and did it. And I don't necessarily recommend that most people do it that way. It wasn't a like typical college experience for me. It wasn't easy. But by doing it that way, I gave myself more time post-college. And the biggest benefit for me at the time is I was paying my way through. And anything past 12 credits were free. So I kind of found like life hack. Like I'm able to, any, you know, if I load up a semester with 18 or 20 some credits, I really only have to pay for 12 of those. So I was able to get through college quicker and make it a little bit cheaper too. So I went to CSU, got an education. I don't necessarily consider them college education to be like the, the world's most useful form of education. Like I've learned more in the past two years than I learned during those two years. But at the time, I felt that it was really necessary and like advice from mentors that I had kind of all advised me to go through college. And I did. And I enjoyed my time there. In particular, I had like two professors that I still get along with that were super awesome. During college, I was working for a consulting firm. And so I would fly around just a little bit. And on one of the flights, I ran into um, Isaac. He's one of the founders of SendGrid. Um, he looks over the seat and sees that I have Sublime open up on, on my machine and I'm coding. And so he kind of reaches over and we start chatting. And for the most part, that's, that's a really odd thing. You know, now that I'm out in the Bay Area, like everyone has code up on the screen, like it's a really normal site. But when you're in Colorado, like you never see that. And so, so we hit it off and we started talking. One thing led to the next and I wound up getting a job at SendGrid. 
It's based in Boulder, Colorado. Most people don't know that. When they hear about SunGrid, they think it's a Silicon Valley company. But it's based in Boulder. And I started at, I forget what my employee number was, double digits somewhere, not sure. It's pretty amazing though, just to see how far they've come in like retrospect to be kind of a small office full of just a few folks to, they, they sold the Twilio for $3 billion, which is just bonkers to me. Wow. Yeah. It feels really surreal. It's odd. And then I got kind of tired of being on the, the outside looking into Silicon Valley. You just hear all these stories, you hear about these great companies and all these um, really smart people. And so I convinced Lindsay to move out here with me, scary at the time. And so we, we cut all ties. We moved out here. We found an apartment, like the cheapest apartment we could find. Everything is so expensive out here. And I started drop hunting. When was that? Oh, let's see. 20, 2015? 2015. We moved out here. I started job hunting. And this guy contacted me. He had read one of my blog posts online. We started chatting via email. And uh, at one point he said, hey, you know, let's go grab some dinner. We went and grabbed dinner, started talking, had a really enjoyable conversation. And then he was all doing it incognito. You know, he didn't tell me where he worked. He didn't tell me what he worked on. We were just chatting about technology in general. And then he offered me a job and he became my first boss at Apple. And that was a really amazing experience. I worked with some of the smartest people I've ever worked with. I cannot speak highly enough of the company and the projects that they're working on. And also just learned about what it takes to actually ship software really quickly. Cannot speak highly enough of the company and everything that I learned there. So from there, I started Loeb, which is a, the company mission is to make machine learning simple and understandable for those that aren't machine learnists, those that don't code. And so I got together with Marcus Beisinger and Mike Mattis. And together we started prototyping. We went through several different ideas and iterations of the company. And we wound up with something that we we're pretty happy with. We put out a website and then post that several different companies reached out. And we wound up going well with Microsoft. So it took about a year and a half or two years of development to the acquisition. So can you take a bit more, I know you've mentioned before how you opened that landing page for that website and the response you got from the internet. That was something you didn't expect. Yeah. We were thinking we'd get maybe maybe a thousand different signups. And of those thousand, we'd be able to like look through and find 20 people that we really wanted to work with and give them beta access and kind of understand how they'd use the product. And then by the end, I think we wound up with 20,000, 20,000 plus. And not only just beta signups through the website, but people reaching out via email and all these like people that would write paragraphs and paragraphs. And I felt so bad because we were just overflowed with all of this response. And I honestly felt really bad because there are people that would write just these paragraphs and paragraphs, and we weren't able to respond to them. We weren't able to talk with everyone. And at the time, Loeb was running in the uh, quote unquote cloud, which is really just a machine in my apartment. And so given that capacity restriction, we really had to like pick and choose who the beta customers were at the beginning. So this was here in your first apartment in San yeah, Francisco? Yeah, the very first one that I moved out into, like crappy, crappy apartment. In a corner, there was the Loeb machine. Can you say a bit of what machine you had? Yeah, yeah. It was a, oh man, Marcus and I found it online. We got a like, gaming tower, four different Titan Xs, reasonable, I'm trying to remember which CPU, and then I think 128 gigs of RAM. It was a reasonably beefy machine, and that was able to host, I don't know, where did we get up to? Several dozen, maybe about 50 or so beta customers, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, pretty awesome for being at your house and yeah. not in a data center or somewhere. Yeah, and then when we got acquired, Microsoft had some space up in San Francisco. And so I moved from South Bay up to the city for the first time in about a year and a half uh, since we got the computer, I turned it off. And I kind of realized how quiet my apartment was after I turned it off. Like it had gotten to this background noise that I didn't even realize where it was coming from. And during some of like the colder parts of the year, it kind of warmed my apartment. But it was just this constant white noise machine. I had no idea how much it was generating until I turned it off. As I read online, right, the purpose of Loeb or the initial idea was to make deep learning accessible for everyone. Right. It's funny you mentioned the word that I hadn't heard before is machine learnists. Oh, yeah. <laughs> which is like, you know, the people who do machine learning, that's becoming a thing. Right. But it's usually on the high proficient end of people who know maybe math or some computer science or things like that. Yeah. There is a lot of people that don't have access to it. So can you talk a bit more about the intent of the project and and you know I also highlight how not Apple looking but how refined the landing page appealed to me when yeah. I first visited it I came across it but yeah can you talk about why that intent or that intention of making it so refined in terms of design yeah. and also what's the deeper initiative on the project yeah yeah we spent a lot of time on the interface to make it look refined the word I might use there is something like consumer like Basically trying to make it feel more like a consumer tool and less like a tool. 
usually when you start using, especially like engineering tools, they have all this terminology and the interface is just very cluttered and confusing and tried to make it feel more like you're just using your, your phone or your computer. Something that's meant a little bit more for consumers by trying to make it simple and easier. When we started the company, it was 2016. And this was just at the height of you know machine learning being written about in the New York Times and this level of hype, which meant that there were all these people who were starting to look at machine learning, uh, specifically deep learning, and say, oh, okay, I think I could, sol- I could probably solve my problem with this. Because at a high level, machine learning is actually really easy to understand. It's the same way that we teach our kids. It's the same way that we learn, to be honest. It's looking at a bunch of data, finding the patterns, and that it's an input-output. If you don't need to understand anything that happens in the middle, it's really easy to understand. And so people were trying to figure out, okay, I think I could solve my problem. It's not cat versus dog, but it's something else versus something else. And then they, they dive into TensorFlow. And I just saw this happen over and over again. I saw it happen with folks at Apple. I saw it happen with friends. They dive into TensorFlow and they just get lost because there's all this, there's 60 years of just like terminology that people have built up that honestly have really easy definitions, like once you learn what they are. But when you hear it, it doesn't make any sense at all. Like you hear like ReLU, like this rectified linear unit. It sounds like this wildly complicated thing. And then when you learn what it is, you're like, oh, that's, that's super simple. If you described it with different words, and you described it a little bit more cleanly, it's really easy to understand. But when you say rectified linear unit, it's really hard to understand. And there's so much of this buildup that people just drop off. They lose enthusiasm. For people that don't know what it is, TensorFlow is uh, Google's oh, yeah. open source framework for uh, doing deep learning and machine learning. Yep. And yeah, I mean, you can do a lot of other stuff. Yeah, yeah. And when you dive in, it's just, there's just kind of all this overhead, all this stuff you need to learn. Or you try to read a paper. And again, there's all this like backlog of things you need to learn before you can even read the paper. And so we wanted to be able to, we saw all these people trying to use machine learning, failing, and then just giving up and wanted to give a, them a tool that they could use to, to solve their problems. When you talked about machine learnists, it's an incredibly small group. People talk a lot about how few computer scientists there are in the world. And then of those, though, there's a very small fraction of computer scientists are machine learnists. It's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of people that understand how this works. But at a high level, it's actually really easy to understand. And so if you can make the tooling simple and understandable, more people can use it. And that's been one of the really amazing things of building a product is that I get to see all the other projects that people build with the tool. Because there are amazing, super creative people out there that just aren't computer scientists or aren't machine learnists, but I get to see the projects that they build. That's been really awesome to see. Can you mention a few of those? Yeah. Yeah, let's see. So, well, there's one. You, you, well, you saw it in uh, Smart Geometry. So we went to Toronto and they had this conference at, what was the, what was the name? It was the School of Architecture. It was like Daniel, Daniels. Daniels, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful building. Makes sense for architects. You know, it was a gorgeous building. And we got maybe about two dozen or so students kind of around a table and gave them access to Lope and just saw the projects that they built. One of which Samantha, uh, Samantha Walker did. She took all this data from UC Berkeley where they have this wind tunnel. And so far the process has been design a skyscraper, 3D print that skyscraper, take it down to this like multi-million dollar wind tunnel, stick it in the wind tunnel, collect a bunch of data, and then go back to the drawing board on your skyscraper. Because apparently when you're building a skyscraper, and this is another thing I get to learn about all these different fields, so when you're building a skyscraper, one of the, the metrics that you're constantly aware of is its wind resistance, which I hadn't really thought about before, right? You kind of think about a big steel building, you know, is a little wind really going to blow it over? But apparently that's something you really worry about when you're building. So they have this wind tunnel, they have all these different ways of testing. As you can see, that's a really slow process. You have to design the building, 3D print it, go stick it in the wind tunnel. And so she took all this data and made a regression model that tried to guess at the, the skyscraper's score. So send in a 3D model of a skyscraper and output just a single number. The higher the number, the better the model would perform in the wind tunnel. And using something called Grasshopper, she was able to like make that model and be able to interact with it in the 3D software that she's already used to. So she gets a little number in the right-hand corner and she can kind of like play around with the model, make changes and see what the output would be. It's all these like creative projects where I would have never thought to do that. I didn't even know that was a problem to, that could be solved. By putting out a tool that helps other people, you get to see these really creative people build their own projects. She was designing a building or editing a building shape in Grasshopper and then sending that building to the machine learning model and then getting a score back. From Lobe, yeah. Speaking of creativity, there isn't necessarily a whole lot of work put into how to send through a 3D model. And so she's like, okay, well, I can work around this. And she did, what did she call it? Oh, a 3D massing model. She would send a plane through the 3D model and then grab this like grid of images that would be like at each time step where the plane was intersecting with solid material. So she was able to kind of turn the 3D model into a 2D image. That kind of made sense. That performed well. It's pretty cool to see. 
encoding the 3D building into sections as yeah. an image, right? And sending it to the model. Yeah, exactly. Where the colored bits are where the like plane is intersecting with a uh, physical material. Are there any other projects that you'd like to share? Yeah, let's see. We had a few people reach out, like dads or moms, who wanted to build a very simple image classifier that would take an image of a book and be able to recognize which book it was. And it's amazing that I saw this idea several different times from people all over the world, where once you recognize which book, they wanted to be able to play audio, like make a small Raspberry Pi or something, play audio of them reading that book. So their children could like hold up a book to a camera and then the audio of that book would start playing through the speakers, right? <laughs> I found it kind of interesting that trying to like automate evening children duties. So the parent would re pre-read the book, create like an MP3 file. And all they needed the machine learning to do is when a kid would hold up a book to the camera, for the camera to recognize which book they're holding up so they knew which MP3 to play. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Let's see. So we had one person reach out who wanted to, they did ocean research around Hawaii. And apparently keeping track of where dolphins migrate to is really important for like regulatory purposes. So you can kind of understand, you know, where do you allow boats to go? Try to keep them away from the dolphins. And, but tracking dolphins is a little difficult. You have to like take them out of the water, tag them. Um, and then you can only do that to a few dolphins. You don't want to do that to everyone. But it turns out that a dolphin fin is actually just like a face, like it's universally recognizable. And so they wanted to create a model that would, it would be two separate models. The first one would be looking at an ocean and they had all these boat buoys sitting out there with cameras on them. And looking out at the ocean, recognize when a fin comes above the water and just do object detection. So find the fin. And then once you find the fin, crop that out and send it through another model that would do basically facial recognition on the fin. And so that you could tell, okay, the last sighting of this particular dolphin, Bob, was at this place. And then it was here and then it was here. And you can kind of start to see the migration patterns in more clear detail than just tagging dolphins. I mean, a much less intrusive way too. It's fascinating being able to follow along other people's projects and see that they're using your tool. You're trying to make machine learning more accessible. But at the end of the day, that is a high level abstraction of a problem. And then going back to what you mentioned before of like people getting lost, doing TensorFlow and getting diving into it. Is this hiding the complexity behind it because some people don't need to learn machine learning? Yeah, yeah. I see what you're getting at. We're trying to find the right balance where, yes, if you're someone that's honestly just not interested in the machine learning and just views it as this black box and you give it data and it pops out an answer, then you should be able to to get started. And most people will get started there no matter what. But at the same time, try to have a little bit of a springboard and education within the product so that if you want to kind of understand what's going on, you can go in, you can dive in, you can see the model, you can see the convolutions, you can see what AutoML built for you, and then start using that as a springboard to go start Googling. And if you want to see, okay, this model here is something called ResNet, you know, I can go Google that. And it was pre-trained on something called ImageNet, and I can go Google that. It gives you a springboard to kind of understand what's happening behind the scenes and go for the research elsewhere. But at the same time, you can get started really easily. That's what I somehow was expecting to hear. I think there are already some other examples of that, right? Visual programming environments are used on the design field, like you mentioned before, Grasshopper, or Dynamo, or other ones that you start by putting notes together and then generating geometry, generating numbers or things like that. But then when you reach a level of expertise where the tool is a bit limited for your needs, yeah. is when you have to go and then customize with custom functions, your own code, and then maybe it's a good entry point for kids or designers or people who are not really versed on, on coding. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You mentioned before that you had this big machine on your at your house, right? <laughs> yeah. And then one of the things that the Microsoft acquisition did was accelerate the development, right, and the rollout of, of this product. I would like to hear how joining Microsoft changed the project at Loaf and also you personally in, in the way you work or relate to other people you're working with? Yeah, so when we joined Microsoft, we joined the office of the CTO. So that's Kevin. And he has been incredibly supportive. And the biggest area where we've received help is A, more people. You know, at the time of acquisition, it was three of us. And now we're something like 18. I mean, it's significantly bigger in a year and just a few months. So that has been amazing. And the team that we've hired is absolutely incredible. And then the second is just a place to work. Before we were working out of you know, loud coffee shops or just out of home or sometimes across in a different continent. Having a solid place to work while being maybe a little bit less fun than working remotely. Both of them have their pros and cons, but it, it is really awesome to be able to sit in the room with 10 other people and work all day. It's definitely very different than coffee shops for sure. The early days were much different than they are now. 
I think it was Elon Musk that has a quote that goes something like, creating a company or starting a startup is like staring into a black hole chewing glass. I don't know if I'd call it that bad. That's a pretty like vivid image there. But it was, it was way more work than... I had a pretty high estimate compared to anyone else I talked to about how much work it would be to, to get it off the ground and get it completed. But even then, it was still more work than I thought it would be. It was nights and weekends. You just didn't recognize whether it was a holiday or not. It was for the three of us, it was just constant communication. I interacted with them during the, the two years before joining Microsoft, way more than I interacted with Lindsay, than I inter interacted with any other friend. It was just, you were constantly around the same three people. You wake up in the morning, you like reach over to the side of your bed, grab your laptop, and you just go until, until you're tired and you have to go to bed. I don't really see another way to start a company because really that's the, only, that's the only advantage you have over a bigger company. The fact that you're willing to put in a large amount more effort than they are and everyone else at big company x is just going to do nine to five just kind of treat their job like a job and if you have that level of passion and that level of work towards maybe a very similar goal that other companies have you can outpace them but only if you're willing to put in that effort and are there any things that you missed from those early days when you know you were working in your own startup or maybe you could travel more Yeah, in the beginning, there was a certain level of freedom that was pretty nice. I was able to travel around and do this uh, rather large, about three or so months Asia trip, be able to work on Loeb during the days and then during the evening when I needed a break, you know, be able to go explore Japan or, or Hong Kong or Singapore or wherever I was. I also traveled around with this group called Hacker Paradise, and I can't recommend the group enough. You go look them up. They interview you and they find kind of a group of really smart folks. We did the Bali leg of the trip with about 20 or so other people. You have a co-working space with solid Wi-Fi and just 20 or so like really awesome people that I still keep in contact with. So you're able to like work alongside them. And so when I was building some of the initial parts of Loeb, I was working with them and I was able to just bounce ideas off of a group of other people and do so in a you know, beautiful place like Bali. I'm curious, were you traveling with Lindsay or on your own? So were yeah, yeah, I was traveling with Lindsay. Nice. It's definitely one of the best trips we've ever done. It was Wow, awesome. four months? Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Did you have any other hobbies or anything that you took with you along these trips that you did? Yeah, so let's see, I took my camera and I'm definitely deeply in love with photography. One of my other side projects is visual programming. And I actually see both of them highly related. I think in order to be wildly creative, in order to like increase your creative capacity, you need to be able to see the effect of what you're doing in real time. And there's actually a bunch of studies around this too. Like the human brain is able to understand the environment you're in if you get like immediate feedback, which makes sense, right? And so one of the reasons I love visual programming is that you're able to Like jump in, you know, change a number and you see the output right away. That's very different than going into code, changing something, running over to the terminal, hitting compile, seeing the output, scrolling up to the right part of the output. That feedback loop is so much tighter. And one of the things I got out of photography, in particular, these like new mirrorless cameras, the Fuji films, I know we both, we've got a Sony over there and I love it too, but the Fuji films in particular are great because they've got dials for, you know, like ISO, shutter speed, aperture, for like every little thing you could change about your computer or change about your uh, camera. They've got a different dial and you see that effect immediately. So you can look at the screen and you kind of kind of change the aperture and you see the depth of field change in the image. You see more stuff come into focus or less stuff. And I always had like a working understanding of how cameras worked, you know, maybe by reading a book or something when I was younger. But you're able to just get a much deeper understanding of the three different ways you can change the light and the color and the focus inside of an image when you can just reach out, kind of like change something and see it happen in real time. Yeah, so I think this is this touches on the topic of uh, what's called direct manipulation, yeah, right? So yeah, you yeah. you have an interface that allows you to change something and see the effects completely. So you have the feeling that you are doing something and it's not the computer that's processing for you and then giving yeah. you some output. Yeah, exactly. That's one of the most exciting things that when machine learning gets up to speed in being really fast and, yeah. and immediate, uh, we're going to see a lot of new interactions take place. Definitely. So how does a day in your life look like? I start every day at 4.15 in the morning. That's when my alarm goes off. I and mean, if I'm being honest, I'll hit snooze once or twice. It kind of depends. And then from there, I'll get up and I'll write my to-do list. It's one of the very first things I'll do in the morning. And I've got a little bit of a system for it. So I'll use an app called Bear, which is like Markdown. I start a new note and at the very top, put the date. And that'll be today's note. And in there will go sometimes message drafts, a bunch of different notes, maybe even like small journal entries, like everything from that day. But at the very top is the to-do list. And when I started this morning routine, I originally started having like gigantic to-do lists because it felt so good. When you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh man, I'm going to do like these 20 different things. You just keep writing things down. I found there's just something about writing something down that you're going to do that makes you feel productive. I, I see it in other, like every human I've ever interacted with. 
And it feels so fucking good to like write down these 20 things. You're going to be so productive today. And then of course, we all know where this story goes. You don't get those 20 things done. And instead started to clean that up a little bit and try to write three things. It does two things. One, that means you can actually accomplish those three things and do them really well. But two, you have to agonize a little bit about like, okay, what am I actually going to get done today and be real about it? And then from there, I'll try to get in meditation and working out. It'll kind of depend on the day. And then because I wake up early, there's less distractions. There's less kind of everything else going on. And I'm able to code. I'm able to do whatever that day needs me to do. Do it in flow state and do it without distractions for at least a few hours. Then, you know, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., I'll roll around. Other people start coming into the office. From that point forward, there's a lot of meetings. There's a lot of the regular stuff you need to do in life, the communication. Past that, it really depends on the day. Like sometimes there's more coding to do. Sometimes there's more work. Sometimes there's more meetings. It really depends. Do you do any exercise or meditation? So uh, in the morning, I'll usually do meditation. I, yeah, I use this app called Oak. And the one option in there I use is, uh, what do they call it? Unguided. And basically allows you to have a chime every like two minutes and go for something like 15, 20 minutes. And you're supposed to use the chime to remind yourself if your mind has wandered. I found that. And I, again, I think there have been many studies that kind of show that throughout the day, you will be able to focus on what you're doing much easier if you start off with meditation. I don't know what it is about the human brain that like, I guess you're just practicing. If you're trying to practice focusing in the morning, you'll have a much easier time doing it throughout the day. I found that to be really useful. And then when I was down in South Bay, I went to, I went to CrossFit. I drank the Kool-Aid. I got really into it. And then since moving up here, I haven't actually found a really good CrossFit place in SF. I don't know why. It probably has some like economic reason, you know, because CrossFit needs a like gigantic warehouse where you can all kind of spread out with your weights. And I imagine if you charge everyone $100 a month, kind of typical gym memberships, you can actually make that like economically feasible to have like really high prime real estate, a gigantic space to be able to do CrossFit and still make that make that equation work out. So since I wasn't able to find a good one, I instead found this uh, yoga place that I really like. It's called a uh, Love Story Yoga and the Mission. Kind of drank the Kool-Aid there and been falling in love. What are you looking for when you do meditation? You have talked about focusing and, and things. What's the intent of actually having a, a space for, for thinking or reflecting in the morning? Myself, probably many others, have just found that once you start doing it regularly, there's this meaningful impact in the rest of your day that you're both able to focus and that you're just a little bit more calm. And those 15, 20 minutes, you know, wind up getting you an hour, a significantly more productivity throughout the day. Like it's a win-win. It's something that works in your favor. Are there specific things that make you be able to focus better or maybe things that distract you? Yeah. I, like many others, have started to realize that the smartphone thing we carry around can be really distracting and have started to become really rigorous with what apps I allow to have notifications. Um, I can probably count on my fingers the amount. There's probably like eight or nine apps that I actually allow to send me notifications. The rest, you know, you got to delete it. You got to get off your phone. Never, ever. No badges, no notifications, no nothing, no distractions. That's one. I'm a fairly big fan of, since we last talked, I think, since it was a year ago, Apple has since introduced the like screen time. I think that was in iOS 12. So this might be new. I've somewhat gotten pretty big fan of that. If I'm able to set it up so that it, I will only pay attention to a very small number of apps during, you know, starting at maybe about 8 p.m. all the way until about 8 a.m. and don't hit that like ignore, ignore limit button, but actually I like, really try hard to, to follow it. I've become a fan of that. It's kind of nice. Yeah, it's super hard to, to do. Yeah. I mean, you just say, give me 15 more minutes. Right, right. Yeah. And when I first started using screen time, I would always just It became such a habit, right? I see that screen. I didn't even have to think about it. You just hit that ignore limit, 15 more minutes. But once you kind of train yourself to just not hit that button, you can make that tool kind of useful. It's really easy to get distracted with those things. And I mean, personally, for me, every time you get the phone and you're, you know, you have a really clear direction, you wanted to go to read that email because yeah. you need to look for that code or whatever thing. And then you always find notifications on the way. You end up browsing different things and it's five minutes later and you're still doing something you were not meant to do. So it's like, right. oh, this, this really quick thing, right? I think Kevin Kelly quotes the Amish when they said like, why don't you have a TV? Oh, if I had a TV, I would watch it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you got to go cold turkey. It's a bit too much there, but it's about your philosophy or understanding how things make you behave differently and be aware of that. So I know as well from our previous conversations, you have a big intent on being present, right? Not not only being present in the moment, but also being aware of death, right? Yeah. Like we're all dying and I would love to hear myself and 
for the listeners to hear how do you approach that, that the fact that we're going to die, how do you make it present in your daily life, and also what exactly your in attempt of, you know, quote unquote, avoidance of regret yeah. uh, means, right? Why do you do that? I'm definitely not the first person to, to notice this. I think Steve Jobs has a quote, and kind of many, many people before him, probably some of the first humans even started to realize this, that once you remember that you're going to die, it really helps refocus you in the moment because you start to realize all this shit I'm doing, it doesn't matter. One of the visualizations, you might call it, that I like to go through every once in a while is just, okay, I'm sitting on my deathbed. In all likelihood, probably, using probabilities, I have like the highest probability of dying on my deathbed. That is to say that like, I will get to old age and I will probably know, doctor will tell me, hey, you've got a couple months to live. Maybe my heart's going bad or, or something. Imagine being on your deathbed. It might not actually be a bed, you know, you're told standing up. But imagine being there and just looking back on your life and feeling regret. Like that to me has to be one of the worst feelings in the world to know that you're about to leave and you just, it didn't mean anything. And by thinking about that, not often, it's a very depressing thought. You don't have to do it every day. But every once in a while thinking like, oh, okay, well, I am what I doing right now. Will that mean anything when I'm on my deathbed? It really helps refocus. I found several different habits or maybe career paths or things that I've just in my life that I've pruned away because I've realized that, hey, that will mean nothing to me when I'm older. And, and it's been one of the best tools I've found to, to refocus. What are some of the more you know, specific things you do in your day-to-day? One of them day-to-day is this app called We Croak. We Croak. We so Croak. We C-R-O-A-K, yeah. right? Yeah. Like the frogs? Yeah, yeah. Like we will eventually croak. When did I find out about it? Maybe about two or three years ago. And it's an incredibly simple app. All it does is send you a notification five times a day. That notification says, remember, you will die. And I found it to be really useful because I'll be on my phone. Again, like you said, you know, you went to go check your email and then you got lost in this other email. And then you're all of a sudden you're checking Twitter and I'll get that notification and I'll be like halfway through, I'll be on Twitter or I'll be reading an article. And at the time it felt like, hey, this article seems really useful, but I'll see the notification. It'll be like, oh, wait, what I'm doing right now, like it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm not actually reading this. I'm just going through some habit. And immediately either put the phone down or maybe sometimes I'll be doing something bigger than just like phone is the distraction. Like I'll be working on a feature of the product or I'll be, I'll be in a meeting or maybe I'll be interacting with other people. I'll kind of realize like, wait a minute, I, don't, I, I shouldn't actually be here right now. Maybe I shouldn't include these people in my life. Like they're actually like damaging to me or they're this article, like I'm not actually going to remember this article in like 30 minutes. Just stop reading it. Having that notification, I think it comes from like an old... It says in the app, like an old like Buddhist tradition or something. If you're reminded five times a day that you're going to die, it makes each day much more meaningful. And I found that relatively to be true. It's a nice little app. It's one of the very few that I allow send me notifications. So one thing I really want to do, so Apple doesn't allow you to make custom watch faces yet. I really want them to allow this. Maybe someday they will. Because I'd love to be able to look down at my watch and not only see that, you know, right now it's uh, 2.15, but to also see a countdown timer. I've got, you know, maybe like 80 years or something left in my life. And to see that like constantly throughout the day sounds absolutely amazing to me. I have found though the widgets on your home screen, those can have a, those are custom obviously, and they can have a countdown timer. So they can be responsive down to the milliseconds. So you can just see those milliseconds counting down to death. I really wish I could do that with a watch. You can have compilations, but the compilations can't update. Like you can't have milliseconds, you can't even have minutes. I looked into it. A little bit of a bummer. You want to be able to look down at your watch. You want to see this like counter counting down. Maybe eventually I can have that. Last time we talked, we talked a little bit about my file system. On Dropbox, I've got a like projects folder. And basically everything goes in there. For instance, this podcast, we have a few notes. Every single thing I do gets its own project folder. The naming scheme I have for that is the very first number is the number, like predicted number of years until I die. And then it has the date afterwards. And it's done that way so that's sorted correctly. So, you know, the proper stuff's up at the top. But it's also kind of nice. You can kind of like scroll through and see, all right, here's where, you know, here's when I was 19. Here's when I was 20. How many days do you have left? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd have to look. It's a relatively large number. So it's in days. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing it in days just so that the so that I see a change every day and that Finder will like sort my folders correctly. Okay. And how do you calculate that number? Oh, I have a just a little Unix script. So in the command line, yeah. Perfect. For some people it might look like too much, <laughs> but I think it's uh I don't know. It would be good to try it. Yeah, definitely. I found other people that everyone has their own like little system. I was talking with someone at a conference recently and they had it their uh, Chrome tab. So every time they open up a new tab, the, the screen they see has nothing else but a countdown timer to the day they die. 
And just to touch on that, what you're mentioning is what's called the, your statistical death, right? How do you calculate that? Yeah, I'll have to look it up again. Maybe about five or six years ago, I did a bunch of Googling. And it turns out if you know some interesting details about your DNA, obviously your current age, the environment you live in, etc., you can kind of input all of this information into a statistical model people out there have created and get output a time till death. Yeah, and in reevaluating what you're spending your time on, what are some of the things that you try to do away from the machines, right? away from the keyboard, from the screen, and in the analog world? Yeah, <laughs> man, anything I say here is just going to be cheesy. It really is. Like spending time with Lindsay. I mean, these are things where, again, you're sitting on your deathbed. Am I ever going to regret spending time with Lindsay? Absolutely not. So that's like an easy default. Yeah. Spending time with friends, doing this with you, those human Thank connections. You. Yeah. <laughs> those human connections, like I'm never, ever going to regret those. It's and, an easy, easy default. And this is something Adam and I met a year and a half ago or whatever that is, May 2018, right? Yeah. And we stayed pretty good in touch. We've done a few calls, we've done email and stuff. So I would like to hear a bit more, what's your workflow for that? Many times we think that these things like social connections or leisure time or things like that are just the things that you don't have to think about. But if you want to keep them, and this is something that Cal Newport really, really recommends, is like you need to plan ahead for that. Yeah. Set the time where you're going to go out with friends, set the time where you're going to do the things that you want to have time for. Yeah. And, you know, you get to put some effort in, in keeping social connections as well. Yeah, definitely. You have to prioritize it. You know, I don't have a, for 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. is when I'm going to send emails to friends or something. I don't have it down to a schedule, but I have it just mentally very high priority. Anytime I get some spare time, make sure to talk with those around me, whether or not that means texting or hopping on a call or trying to meet in person, like whatever you can. Uh, you just have to prioritize it. It's also a little odd for me too, because growing up, like, <laughs> like a lot of engineers, I was uh, maybe a little more antisocial. And it's been interesting to watch myself grow and to, to start really appreciating those social connections and just how much they really mean. Yeah, you mentioned before, right? In, in school, you actually like focus on school. That is something that not many people do, that <laughs> you know, many people get distracted and say, ah, oh, for a year, maybe five, whatever. Yeah, the reason I did that is that it's the same death reason, that time is our most precious resource. Like it's something we all get. We can't get more of it. We can't get less of it. Realistically, I mean, you can eat a little healthier and probably get a little more. But there's there's a very narrow window that that you get and that's all you get and for me going through school i felt like if i did it in two and a half years that's a year and a half of my life i get back yeah no i mean that i think that's awesome and yeah. the fact that you could do it it's it's pretty impressive yeah i would say that there are some times when you have to go through the hard part probably compressing your studies in 2.5 years and not going out that much as other people or their friends or going partying or getting drunk more often are really hard. It's tough on the moment. But then maybe later, might be directly after when you say, oh, I'm done and people have to continue studying or maybe now I can go and get a job or, you know, you feel the rewards afterwards. And that's something that I'd like to touch on the topic of, of crit, right? Because what we see is a lot of athletes or professionals or things like that, they kind of start enjoying the effort you got to go through. So you start being accustomed of the challenge. You know it's gonna you're gonna suffer in terms of you know your muscles are gonna be strained and you're gonna have to push more, but you get to like it and in some way that practice that daily effort is what makes you keep going. So I would like to know if there are any other things that you've done that are considered for you deliberate practice projects, things that you do to maybe try to improve skills or or things that you want to become better at and if there is any role that greed plays in your life. Because actually one interesting fact is that Adam mentioned greed was an important part of your, your work or your life in, in some extent last time we talked, but I hadn't read the book. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I actually read the book in the last month or, or maybe two months ago. And now I can, you know, I have a bit more context. I can understand. I mean, I would summarize greed is like keep pushing, you know, when it yeah. hurts and, and feel the rewards afterwards, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, grit's kind of a weird word. And the book goes into like trying to define it. The word grit is meaningful to me because when I was younger, I don't know how much anyone really needs to read into any of this. I don't know how much I need to read into it, but psychologists out there diagnosed me with mild autism and a severe Asperger's, severe dyslexia, severe OCD, like a whole bunch of like, there's just a list of things. They just like put you into a bucket. And I don't know, little, little old me kind of didn't quite know how to like process this. 
because it was at a time where Bill Gates would mention during interviews his IQ level. And I didn't quite know how to like, how to rationalize that. Out here in San Francisco, there's quite a homeless problem. There's not nearly that big in Colorado where I grew up, but there's some. And you see, you know, you go into a King Supers, like a grocery store, and you know, you see a few people in the parking lot who are clearly living in their car, something like that. And my mom has this really vivid memory one day when I, I kind of talked about how I felt like that would be my life at some point. Like I would probably live in a car. Mainly because, I mean, it sounds weird to say right now, it really does. But at the time, it was a very binary, right? Like either you're successful and you're Bill Gates with a high IQ, or you're not successful and you live in a car. There's just, there was no middle ground for me. And obviously my mom didn't particularly like hearing me say that. And she did some research. And so she found this, I think it was from Harvard, some you know fancy sounding school, had this paper on the power of grit. And basically what the paper goes over is that grit, if you can find a way to measure it, similar to IQ, it's hard to measure, but it winds up being a significantly better predictor of life than IQ, than of success, than of like life happiness. And so at a young age that had a, like a really big impact on me, because I kind of like came to the conclusion, like, all right, I'm never going to be the smartest person in the room, but I will outwork everyone and that that will be me. And so it had this like lasting impact on me. And then more recently, there's been a book that we were just chatting about that went into, I think they covered that paper as well as like several other papers. The test that you're talking about, I think in the book at least, and I think this is something that the writer is Angela Duckworth. Yeah. I think she quotes a paper, but her research or her PhD or something was actually coming up with what she called the grid scale. So it was a test that they will hand in to, to kids in, in, in schools and stuff. The point of this research is that you hand it to kids or to someone at some point in their lives, they do it. And then you try to use the results of each individual as a predictor of how successful they're going to be later in life. Right. And trying to see how coping with something and sticking with it for longer or like putting effort through the hard bumps is going to actually make you more or less successful. And for me, running is probably like the perfect example of grit. Like I hate running. It really sucks in the middle of it, but I know it has all these big benefits afterwards. There's the immediate feedback, like right after you stop running, you've got maybe a runner's hire, like your body's flowing with some sort of chemical, it feels good. But then you also know it has these like long-term benefits. But during the run, like it sucks, you just have to push through it. Sometimes exercises are also like, how long can you run on the on the mill, right? Yeah. On the running mill. It's like a lot part of it is you need to be fit. But even if you're not fit, like compare yourself to somebody who's physically at the same point, psychologically, you're going to be able to do five or 10 minutes or, or more, right? Yeah. To last longer. Did you end up then taking the test or how, how did this measure? Because I mean, I think that's a huge thing. It's like something that you go through when you're younger and then you find some, maybe the doctor tells you, oh, you're diagnosed with this thing or this thing or this thing that might be or not true. It's a tag. But then when you have something more actionable and say like, L let's follow, let's try to follow this and stick with things. Yeah. Because that's, I don't know. I mean, I, I think before we didn't have that much cues on on that sort of behavior it would be like what you said before like it's iq yeah. high or low and that's it that's what defines and it's, you and it's written in stone and and i think the equation is you know like you have talent right like mm -hmm. you have innate talent or something you have some pre i don't know how they call it talent maybe maybe it's talent but the equation is like talent and then effort gives you skill and then putting that together i, I would yeah. have to look it up What was her name? Angela? I don't think I took it at the time when I was younger. There might have been a different, there's probably many different ways to measure grit. And I don't think she had written any of her papers yet. Like I think the paper I had read when I was younger was kind of before her time. Actually, you know, I might ask my mom, she might have some paper sitting around or like some scores sitting around at the time. Are there any things that you did when you were young that you actually seem to stick for longer than other people? I mean, just the fact of going to school with, you know, doing it at that pace, I think that That shows yeah. a lot of great. <laughs> <laughs> That's one thing. Starting a company or going through um, and trying to work out every day. I mean, all of these things kind of wear on you in a certain way and just being willing to push through them. And they have the big reward at the end if you could just push through. Yeah. And the other, well, first of all, thanks a lot for, for sharing this with us. Oh, yeah. It also gives some hint of everything is not, is something that I personally, I think I've talked about this on the podcast before. It's like, People see me sketching, for example, and it, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, it yeah. looks so good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, of course. His mom also sketches. That's like inherited or yeah. something or like, yeah, effortless. Like how lucky you are. Like, you've done this. But it's not true, right? It's not true. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't go and fight, argue with everyone who says that or whatever. I really appreciate that. It's like, it, it's also nice to hear. And that's what I love, why I hate IQ as measurement and why I love something like grit or 
something else because it, it's malleable. And I, like, I really celebrate the malleability of humans. It's much better to recognize that you can do anything you set your mind to given enough, enough time um, and enough effort. But look at it that way and not just kind of like cross off all these things you can't do in life because you just weren't born with it, born with the right DNA or, or whatever. Yeah. You find somebody who's been coding or doing machine learning after 10 years or maybe, I don't know, maybe eight years or I don't know how long this has yeah. been around for, right? And the modern techniques, it's not that it comes that easy. You know, yeah. some people might come easier than others, but it's at the end of the day, how much effort, how much you put into it. Yeah. And sometimes I think even people through no like malice, maybe you've been doing machine learning for 10 years and you're talking about it. You talk about it like it's really easy. And you're kind of portraying something incorrect. And again, people doing this might not be doing it purposefully, probably aren't doing it purposefully, but they, they display how easy it was because they've forgotten how hard it was. In the beginning, they forgot how they've learned all this terminology and how all of this is added up to them being like really good at a task. They've forgotten all that, how hard it was and they portray it as being like, now it's this really easy thing. And I think the bad thing, right, the good thing for us, but also the bad thing is that our brain is really good at removing all those yeah. struggles that you had at the beginning yeah for me that's why i try to follow this thing of journaling and many in many of my 200 word snippets of random days last yeah. year or something i describe these struggles before doing something before doing a test the first right. time i touch a neural network or the first time i do an interview or i don't know just fears and yeah. struggles and things like that that you describe as well as things that make you happy i mean you forget everything but if you go back and then see it you say like wow Back in 2016 or 2017, I was really scared about this thing or right. meeting this person or doing this project. Right. And then, as you said, it's malleable. So it changes. Right. So yeah, I mean, that that's one th actionable thing that I would recommend, like actually leaving a log, like a chronological log of some of these yeah, random I need, I need to follow your example there. I've tried journaling a few times. It hasn't quite stuck, but I'll get it to stick. Yeah. So the initial question, actually, the topic was, if you had any drills, anything deliberate that you do, you said you mentioned, for example, practicing like the, the visual programming as a, as a way of learning oh, yeah. the things you're working on. Are there any other things that you're trying to do to practice a skill or maybe there's no time right now? Yeah, a little bit. For instance, I don't know if you've ever heard of Spark AR. It's this uh, project Facebook put out to create the Instagram filters. Um, it's actually kind of cool that they published that, being able to give people this programming environment, this visual programming environment where you can create a new filter, stick it out there. It's a, it's a form of creativity. And I've been playing around with that, just kind of recreating some like old Mac OS filters that you used to... Remember on the webcam, you could open up Photo Booth. So I've been like recreating some of those in Spark. I'll dedicate maybe like two or so hours on the weekend sometimes to do that. This is something where I don't really know what the immediate benefit of this thing is. Probably nothing. But by doing it, I learned a little something. Like I've learned a lot about shaders that I didn't understand before. And so I'd say, if you have the time, sometimes you just don't have the luxury. It kind of depends on what stage of life you're at. But if you can set aside a few hours and just learn something random, usually you'll find some way to connect that back into your day-to-day -day life. So one thing that you mentioned last time that I was really attracted to was the way that you get some of your clothing. Oh yeah, it's a little odd. We talked before about how I, I did a little traveling and I was in Bali for a bit. Like a lot of other people, I find value in having just like really good clothes that you can just throw on in the morning. You don't have to think about it. That's extremely common at this point. It's one less decision to make in the day. For those of you who haven't met me, I'm extremely tall. And so it can be even harder to kind of find good clothes, which puts yet another level of emphasis on finding clothes that actually fit and then just doing a bunch of them. Before, when I was younger, anytime that I would find something in a store that would fit, I'd buy like everything on the shelf because I know that I'm just going to, it's very rare that I'll be able to find something. Anyway, when I'm in Bali, they have a reasonable textiles industry there. And I was sitting in this, I guess you call it a cafe, and uh, I was enjoying some some food and I overhear this two people sitting next to me talking. And one guy's talk, showing the other these shirts that he just had made. And he's going over the clothing used or that like the cloth used, the way that the inseams were done, the way that some of the like etching on the side was done. He was clearly very passionate about clothes. And he was like, hey, I just had this batch made, you know, what do you think about this? And so I lean over and just ask like, oh, you know, where'd you get that batch made or, or started talking to him about his, clearly his passion of textiles. And about 30 or so minutes into the conversation, we get to like, you know, hey, I also have a, a desire to make some clothes. And he said, oh, let me, let me show you my person. We get on the back of his motorbike. All of Bali, like they're barely any cars. They're really thin roads. And so we ride around on motorcycles. So I hop on kind of the back of his motorcycle, take one of the most like dangerous trips I've ever taken in my life. Like he's zooming through intersections where there's no stoplight, there's no nothing. We like almost get hit five or six times. And we get to this small little house. He takes me inside 
a like woman comes out to greet me and she has like six or seven kids running around her. I mean, he's like, here she is. Uh, I work with her really closely. She'll you know treat you well. And then he took off. And so she and I are chatting. I go through the the way I like my clothes made. I like, I'd like V-necks with this cloth. You know, we're kind of walking through her house and she has cloth everywhere. I find this, uh, this like cotton bamboo kind of mix that I really like. And here's how I'd like the like inseams done. Here's how I like the edges done. Like a V-neck that goes down to here. I'd like it to be this long. She takes all these measurements of me and she's like, okay, okay, I get it. Come back in about an hour. So I go walk down to the beach. I go for a walk and I come back and she's made one. I try it on. It's perfect. Like it fits perfectly. It's amazing. And so, okay, cool. I've got room in my suitcase for maybe, maybe about, maybe about a dozen or so of these if I roll them up really tight. So can you make a dozen? She goes, sure. So I come back the next day, pick up the dozen. And then she goes, hey, anytime you want more of these, you know, I've written down all of your measurements. I have them all here on this piece of paper. Just shoot me an email at this like Yahoo email address. I'll check it on my little Blackberry here. I'll make more. You can send me money via PayPal and then I'll just mail it to you wherever you want. And so that's been my system now. I've got a bunch of these shirts. Anytime they degrade and they start, you know, having holes or anything, then I'll, I'll send in a new order. I just send her an email. She'll sometimes take as long as like two weeks to respond. I don't think she looks at her back very, very often. And then uh, I'll wire her some uh, money via PayPal. And then like a month or so later, I'll get a package in the mail with all these postage stamps. You know, it's clearly kind of been from office to office to office. I finally get it and I'll just have like another dozen, two dozen of these shirts. She's amazing. I can't speak highly enough of her. She does a really good job. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with the setup. Like before Costume. I had before I had this, it was much harder to get t-shirts that I could wear. Yeah, and I don't think anyone would realize that those are custom made, right? No, They're yeah, really no. they look they look nice. Yeah, they look pretty good. So now we get into the uh the random questions, right? Yeah, I mean <laughs> yeah, some sort of more disconnected questions. So well the first thing I wanna to say is like where can people touch base with you? Where can people contact you? Oh, yeah. So I stick my email and my phone number out there on the internet for all. So people think that's crazy. And it is kind of crazy. I get a lot of spam. But I also get conversation from like incredibly interesting people all over the world. And so I found it the pros that outweigh the cons. So if you go to adamangus.com, and I think we'll probably stick it in like the podcast notes, but my email and phone number will be there. And please reach out if you have something to chat about. Yep. As a reminder, those notes are at gettingsimple.com forward slash Adam. Yeah. A D A M. It's me. And now I just wanted to hear a bit more about things that you might recommend to the listeners. Things like maybe what books would you recommend? Yeah, yeah, let's see. Okay, so we talked about Grit. Highly recommend that book. Then there's, what else have I been going through lately? There's uh, The Rise of Superman, so getting into flow state. Oh, I just started the Einstein biography. A little bit late to that one, but I finally got around to it and it's pretty good. He did a good job writing it. Any other recommendations on like maybe podcasts or movies or TV shows or things like that? Yeah, let's see. There's, well, there's the Getting Simple podcast, of course. <laughs> and then there's, uh, <laughs> um, I'm a little bit biased because, you know, Kevin bought my company, but Kevin Scott also has a podcast. Been listening through it. He does a really good job. So I'd recommend that. And then movies, there's the Creative Brain. It's on Netflix. And then there's a TV show. It's got like 12 episodes. Each episode interviews a new person. I think it's called Abstract. The design show on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. There's actually good stuff on Netflix. You Which gotta, ones like, did you like the most? I only watched one or two. I haven't watched the whole thing. Yeah, so I haven't watched all of them either. The very first one, I think they you know, put one of their better episodes up yeah. in the front. The New Yorker. Yeah, yeah, right? that was good. Yeah, that was really good. Can you mention a purchase of $100 or less that you've done recently that has had a positive impact in your life? <laughs> $100 or less. Let's see, I just, I just bought new shoes. So I, I wore my old shoes to the point that they had holes in them and they were completely falling apart. So I went into their Allbirds, which is like an SF company. So I went into the, the store wearing my shoes. I said, hey, I'd like some of these new ones and I'll give you my old ones. So I just made the exchange right there. That was $100 or less and my feet feel much better. So that's great. Nice. Yeah, I've seen the brand. I like them. Do you, what, what do you get if you give it to them just to recycle them? Recycle, or? yeah. How would you define success? That's hard. Like many others have pointed out, it's definitely not money. It's definitely not a Ferrari or something. The human connection part that we've talked about before, I mean, that's brought me... So I would define success as happiness. Seems pretty reasonable. And the things in my life that I found just a, an overwhelming amount of happiness from are human connection and your work. I extract a lot, a lot of happiness out of my work and doing it well. And then, of course, human connection. Are there any role models, people that you think have been successful or maybe people you try to mimic in some way? If I say Steve Jobs, is that too uh, too cliche? I might be too cliche. Definitely admired him, I think. I never met him. 
I mean, I'm going through the Einstein book. The guy was just really quotable. I mean, I definitely admire both of their minds for different reasons. If you could send one message to the world, what would you say? I'd link it back to the grit. You can do anything you set your mind to. Don't hold yourself back. How do you see a healthy relationship with technology? Where it's balanced. It helps you become a better version of yourself and not the other way around. For the longest time, like adding on to that, you know, you hear like Jonathan Ive or someone else say they really want to make technology invisible. And I never really fully understood that for the like first five years or so of knowing that quote existed. But I've started to realize it a little bit more, what it really means. And it means that you can be yourself, your like human self. Well, technology helps you communicate better or helps remind you of something. It, it helps you in some way. It augments your, your brain in some way that it's, you know, it's not good and kind of naturally. Like naturally, we can't send brainwave out of our brain and contact someone, you know, 2,000 miles away. We can use technology for that, though. But if it becomes addictive or something else, then the technology is not invisible. It's like very present. So to have a healthy, balanced relationship. Where do you get your best ideas or when? In the middle of flow state. So you'll start on a project, start off really rough. And then like an hour or two into solving whatever problem you're working on, whatever product you're working on, whatever it happens to be, you just get into this mode where your brain is like right and left firing good ideas. And I've always had the things I'm most proud of have always come from that place. And what makes you more creative? Probably a few things. I found the meditation, again, really helps. This like cross-disciplinary thing that we just talked about. If you can kind of pull ideas from, if you're working on technology, pull ideas from something outside of technology. We can start to make connections that aren't obvious. That's creative. Reading books, watching videos, doing anything you can do to kind of absorb a bunch of information and be able to make a connection. What do you think of slowing down in life? I found it really valuable to just make sure to spend time with your friends, with your family, disconnected from everything else. I guess that's slowing down in the sense that it's not career oriented, but it's extremely valuable. How do you define simple or simplicity? <laughs> I feel like I'm going to quote the dictionary. A small number of things. Like we were talking before about the to-do list. You know, I'd say that the way I started doing to-do list was very complex and you have this long list and the way I do them now is simple. And it gives you this benefit of the fewer the things there are, usually the higher quality and the more meaningful they are. And how do you define intuitive? Similar to that, making technology invisible. Part of that's making it intuitive, which really just means something that comes naturally to you as a human so that you can, you can focus on something else that you enjoy doing. You know, if you create a product that's intuitive, they can get in, get out, get the job done and don't have to spend a, a whole bunch of brain power in doing whatever. How would you summarize your mission in the design field or in the, you know, machine learning field? Right now, it's make machine learning simple and understandable. And in the future, I'll probably have a different goal. Nice. And I think almost lastly, what impact do you think artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to have in our daily lives? Machine learning will also have a huge impact in healthcare because it'll be able to bring a, a much higher level of quality of care to many more people. You know, there are a very small number of health professionals. And if you can train on the data, even better if you can train on the best of the best. You know, the best of the best can really only serve the like uber wealthy But if you take their data, their expertise, and you're able to train a model on it, now you're able to give the best of the best to everyone. So that's another place where we'll see a, a huge impact. And the third is kind of like the bucket for everything else. One of the models we built in Loeb was to uh, detect whether or not you're playing a ukulele or a guitar. Um, it's just a very simple model that listens to sound. And, and so if you had a tuner app, instead of opening up a tuner app and selecting, hey, I want to tune a guitar, You would just open up the app, start playing your guitar, and it would automatically figure out which tuning interface to show you because it could recognize the instrument. We're just going to see a lot of small optimizations like that where our lives just got just a little bit easier because the machine is able to take over just a little bit more. And what will we do in the time that we save? <laughs> Spend more time with our family, for sure. That's what we should do. The last thing I wanted to ask you, Adam, is if there's anything else that you want to tell our listeners or maybe tell me, ask me, or anything that you want to say before we go. Yeah. So like I said, one of the great joys I found in life is, is human connection. So we've got my, my email and phone number out there. Don't hesitate to reach out if you want to. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Adam. Thanks for your time. And I'm super glad that we could make this happen in person finally. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Maybe we can meet you again sometime in the future. Yeah, sounds good. Maybe when I'm working on my next project. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks. Bye.